shit. <laughs> if you like our video, share them with other people. We feel that the messages that we try to share are, are important and would appreciate you telling your friends or even people you don't like. Why not even say your enemies? <laughs> Definitely if you're friends with the, uh, with elected representatives, definitely share it with them. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Pass it on. Let me tell you about one of my favorite things. It's called peer pressure. This video is about peer pressure. You want to be cool, don't you? You want to be awesome, super, super rad, and any other word synonymous with cool go ahead and like this video share it with your friends because if not you will be less than cool intro okay, I think that's <laughs> episode i'm running out of fingers 10 what are we gonna do once we get like i'm not taking my boots off <laughs> nobody wants that <laughs> uh, 10 Episode, episode 10. 10. Elders <laughs> rising. Welcome. I'm sorry if you're still here. If you're just getting here. Leave. You'll, you'll want to leave soon. <laughs> <laughs> you won't stick around. It's okay. <laughs> Nobody blames you. We understand. Um, so. Right now. Today is Saturday, November something. Sixth or seventh. Um, we all know that the election was earlier this week. And it should be more than obvious, just uh, regardless of which side of the line you fall on, that something fishy is going on. Because for. And we're not going to talk about this all morning. Um, I'm actually thinking that this is going to lead into what we are going to talk about. Um, anyway, if we use, was it Michigan for an example, their Trump was leading Tuesday night by, you know, a fairly, a fairly large margin. And then by the time, between the time that we all go to sleep and we all wake up, they mysteriously find almost 140,000 ballots, and all of those are for um, Joe Biden. You don't have one vote for Trump. You don't have one for Joe Jorgensen, Don Blankenship, anybody. They're all for Joe Biden, and the odds of that being the case are, they're not zero, but they almost might as well be. Um... And there's people who are okay with this, and like I said, regardless of which side of the line you stand on, you shouldn't be okay with this because it's compromising the way that things are done in the Republic. Um, these institutions that are meant to protect us and um, make sure that the people are fairly represented. And there's rumors that... Uh, there's some kind of sting operation that's going to be happening. I kind of doubt it. Don't know. Um, but I have faith that regardless of the out, the outcome, it is, in fact, God's will. Um, he's pretty hard to stop. He's hard to stop. Um, so take, take faith in that. Whether it's the outcome that we want, it is ultimately the outcome that is needed. One of the things that um, is very clear is that, one, um, the Democrats for a long time, they have been, they have been, um, they've known that they can't rely on their base yeah. simply because they don't have, they're not, they're not standing on our moral ground when they, when they encourage um, defunding the police and when they encourage the riots and when um, the media goes and doesn't report or reports falsely on the riots and stuff like that. They consider organizations like the Proud Boys being far right extremists, they're, uh, white supremacists, when the leader of the Proud Boys is a black guy. They, um, they just, just silly things like this where the, the Democrats don't stand on a, 
um, in, from a place where they they can win um, relying on their base. So th their game plan is to demoralize the right. And you have hey. um, Fox News came out and everybody says, oh, that's the far right um, news organization. Uh, what was it? Uh, Tuesday, they were saying that Arizona was, was for Trump when like 80% of the ballots had been cast and stuff like that. And that's before even the, the polls closed. But um, the, if you say people will be like, oh, voter fraud, and then they'll, they'll scoff at that idea. Um, one of the things is voter fraud. It, 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 it hasn't been voter fraud. It's been electoral fraud. It's been polling fraud. It's been those people that are um, doing the polls. You've had uh, videos of, of both, like in Arizona, you had people who were um, given at the, go to the polls and they were given Sharpies and then their ballots were thrown out. And when they tried to write with pens, they, the people, the people running the polls yelled at them and took the pens from them and stuff like that. And they, there was a guy handing out pens in the line and they had security come and, and the sheriff had to come and escort that guy off the premises because he was helping people vote in the correct way. And the people there were, vote, were, were instructing them to vote incorrectly. And, and like, there's, there's just a bunch of, of silliness that's going on. Um, there's a, there's a famous, I, I would like to call it a quote, but I've only seen it in meme form. I'm sure it's a quote from Stalin. <laughs> but um, where he says it's not who casts the votes, or it's not who you vote for, it's who counts your vote that matters. Yeah. And it's 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 very true. Great I mean, paraphrasing. Yeah. If we <laughs> if we don't think that we will, if we think that a banana republic here is impossible, then we're foolish. Um, and so it's very important to to be aware that you know this is going on. But like Mitch said, we don't want to spend too much time on it. Um, it's it's meant to demoralize you don't let it it's your your life is so much more that this election whatever happens god will be able to to make it for our good we'll turn it for our good so yeah that's i think that's about as far as we need to get into it anything else no no um you know i was just wanting to bring up how how divided everything is and we've talked about it before that um you know this is the danger of party politics Absolutely. of the two-party system um, what we've been warned about since the beginning but you have the same two parties representing not us but themselves and their party and their own power and gain for over 150 years and this is the culmination of events um like me for example i mean i'm a registered republican but i very rarely ever vote republican i typically vote with the constitution party because that party represents the things that i believe in the things that that really resonate with me um so that's that's the way that i vote and I mean, I'm not telling people how to vote. Find, find what aligns with your beliefs and your ideals. But we have an obligation to vote for the best candidate, not the candidate we want to win. Some people will say that's throwing away a vote, but it's you're not throwing away a vote. Um, but, I mean, we look at the state that the nation's currently in, and there's division everywhere. Um, people, people no longer identify as an American. We identify as our party or our race or whatever. Um, and that's, that's dangerous. That leads to sowing the seeds of division. Um, cause you ask people and they'll say, oh, I'm a, I'm a Republican. I'm a proud Republican or I'm a Democrat. When the answer is... The correct answer is I'm not a Republican or I'm a Democrat. The correct answer is I'm an American. We have to go back to being to being an American. At that that's at this point that's the only identity that's going to save us. Um, just like at this point the only thing that's going to save the Republic and save our nation is the Constitution. We have to we have to get back to that. Stop being a Republican or a Democrat and be an American. I, 
it's, it's interesting. I think that part of the bigger problem, sorry, I got the smoke in my eyes, but um, <laughs> I think part of the bigger problem is how much we're allowing ourselves to be influenced by media and by um, the, the current events. Um, one of the things that was interesting to me as I was, as I was reading, and um, I'm trying to remember exactly where I was reading, but it had to do with um, how the how we've we've grown as a society and how specifically the printed word has changed um, back a hundred years ago books were something that they were very um, you you had good books because it wasn't worth your time printing garbage it wasn't worth your time printing filth it wasn't worth your time printing smut um, the, love that word yeah smut it, well, it's, it's one of those things where you, you look at like the, the educations that people received a uh, hundred years ago and they were reading things like Shakespeare, they were reading things like um, just, just the philosophers, the Stoics, they were reading things that actually had um, some kind of moral value for their form of, of learning how to read. Not because, oh, we're learning to read for the sake of reading, not because we're, we're gaining this education for the sake of this education, but they, they, they wanted to be able to read and if you wanted to read, you needed to read the things that were the classics, because that was the only thing that was really printed. Now, you look at the way that kids read, and you learn to read through video games. You learn to read through Twitter. You learn to read through, like, because it's necessity in the sense that, okay, these are things that we want to read, but there's we have so much access to so much around us, and the quality of the stuff that you read, the quality of the, of the media we consume, is there's there's a very low bar there's a very low bar on what is valuable and because there we're, we're inundated with so much stimuli we're inundated with so much um uh whether that's news whether that's tv whether that's um movies whether that's video games whether that's uh twitter whether that's facebook we've got anything you want you can have and it's really up to us to be um the stewards of what we consume and and, and the more that we get into this news cycle and realize, and, and think, oh, this is so important for our lives, and this is so important for our lives, the, 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 the half, tr half truth, I would say, but the, the thing that's tricky here is it is important for your life because we do need to stay informed. That's, that's, that's clear. We need to know what our politicians are doing, what our representatives are doing, and how they're trying to screw us over so that they can't. But two, it's not, it's not the most important thing in your life. It's not the thing that should consume your life. It's not going to make the, your, the quality of your life much better or worse unless you, unless you give it that power. Um, the, the, more we, the more attention we give to something, the more power we give to that thing over us. And that's the thing that um, I think that we... That's one of the reasons why I don't really want to talk about the election so much is because it's just what's going to happen is going to happen. We need to be aware. We need to know what's going on. Keep your eyes open, but don't let that control your life. Don't let that consume you. There's so much more to live for. There's so much more about life. There's so much more that um, that we can do to be free. And the more that we give authority to those those um, urges or pulses or or desires to be on the cutting edge of knowing what's going on. Or what did this person say? Or what did that person say? Or whose opinion does this guy have? Or what did this actress say? Or what did that sports guy say? Or did you see that what this this um, coach said? The, this is all drama that just dilutes your life, and it feeds into your life, and it and it ruins your life. It's like it doesn't matter what so and so said. It doesn't matter what this person or that person said. Go live. Go be free. You be free by being it. And that's the thing that I think that we need to remember is um, we need to be ready and willing to stand up for what's right, but you need to live for what's good. Yeah. Be the change that you want to see. Mitch, um, he shared with this. I had never heard it before, but he shared a... Um, a story and uh, it's just it's, it's really powerful um, 
It's long. It's long. <laughs> but oh, oh. it's what's what is the name of it? The right? speech of the unknown. The speech of the unknown, and that's when they were ratifying the Constitution, right? No, this was right right before they signed the declaration. Oh, was it during the okay. Yeah. Um and as we know, um, just like now, getting anybody to unanimously vote on anything is a near impossibility. Yet they were able to get all all the delegates from all thirteen colonies to agree and vote to um, declare their independence from Great Great Britain. Which, I mean, is a big deal. That was, it was treason. It was. If you lose, you're executed. Yeah. And it's and it's not just that. Your family's ruined. You're 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 putting your country through war, and not just any war. It's a war against the greatest empire that had the world had ever seen. The world had ever seen at that point. So. <clears throat> Judas, that's small. Um, so this is from the editor of Reverse Spins. And you can Google this, um, The Speech of the Unknown. The, the following is taken from Washington and his generals, or Legends of the Revolution by George Lippard, published in 1847. The signers of the Declaration of Independence sat in Independence Hall at Philadelphia contemplating losing their heads or being hanged. Their courage wavered. The documents sat there unsigned. An extraordinary catalyst was needed to move them to action. An unknown man rose and gave an electrifying speech. He disappeared soon after. Now, before I start reading this, I'm going to give my theory and what I believe about this story. I believe it's true. There's, there's not a lot of documentation about it, um, but I believe this is true, and I believe that this unknown man standing in the back in a cloak was, in fact, Moroni. You know that he was instrumental in helping, helping to found this nation. Um, so that's just my two cents. Gather gather what you will as if as with any story in history there's going to be detractors there's going to be people to say yeah this didn't happen um but uh, just draw your own conclusions and you know believe what you will about it but there's far too many things that had to happen that were just the odds of it being near zero <clears throat> so this is this is the speech of the unknown by signing the declaration all were guilty of high treason under British law the penalty for high treason was to be hanged by the neck until unconscious, unconscious then cut down and revived then disemboweled and cut into quarters the head and quarters were at the disposal of the crown no wonder they wavered no wonder they discussed back and forth for days on end before signing the document that carried so grave a penalty. An old legend dramatizes the story of the one who galvanized the delegates and gave them the courage to sign that document. But still there is doubt, and that pale-faced man shrinking in one corner s squeaks out something about axes, scaffolds, and a gibbet. Gibbet echoes a fierce, bold voice that startles men from their seats, and look yonder. A tall, slender man rises, dressed although it is summertime in a dark robe. Look how his white hand undulates as it is stretched slowly out, how that dark eye burns, while his words ring through the hall. We do not know his name. Let us therefore call his appeal. Um, just for reference, if you don't know what a gibbet is, it's a gallows. Gibbet, they may stretch our necks on all the gibbets in the land. They may turn every rock into a scaffold, every tree into a gallows, every home into a grave, and yet the words on that parchment can never die. 
They may pour our blood on a thousand scaffolds, and yet from every drop that dies the axe or drips on the sawdust of the block, a new martyr to freedom will spring into birth. The British king may blot out the stars of God from his sky, but he cannot blot out his words written on the parchment there. The works of God may perish, his word never. These words will go forth to the world when our bones are dust. To the slave in the mines they will speak hope, to the mechanic in his workshop, freedom. To the coward kings these words will speak, but not in tones of flattery. No, no. They will speak like the flaming syllables on Belshazzar's wall. The days of your pride and glory are numbered. The days of judgment and, rob and revolution draw near. Yes, that parchment will speak to the kings in a language sad and terrible as the trump of the archangel. Archangel. You have trampled on, mon on mankind long enough. At last, the, voices of the voice of human woe has pierced the ear of God and called his judgment down. You have waded onto thrones over seas of blood. You have trampled onto power over the necks of millions. You have turned the poor man's sweat and blood into robes for your delicate forms, into crowns for your anointed brows. Now kings, now purpled hangmen of the world, for you come... For you come the days of axes and gibbets and scaffolds. For the wrath of man, for you the lightnings of God. Look how the light of your palaces on fire flashes up into the midnight sky. Now purple hangmen of the world turn and beg for mercy. Where will you find it? Not from God, for you have blasphemed his laws. Not from the people, for you stand baptized in their blood. Here you turn and lo, a gibbet. There, in a scaffold, looks you in the face. All around you, death and nowhere pity. Now, executioners of the human race, kneel down. Yes, kneel down upon the sawdust of the scaffold. Lay your perfumed heads upon the block. Bless the axe as it falls. The axe that you sharpen for the poor man's neck. Such is the message of that declaration to man, to the kings of the world. And shall we falter now? And shall we start back appalled when our feet press the very threshold of freedom. Do I see quailing faces around me when our wives have been butchered, when the hearthstones hearth stones of our land are red with the blood of little children? What are these shrinking hearts and faltering voices here when the very dead of our battlefields rise and call upon us to sign that parchment or be accursed forever? Sign. If the next moment the gibbet's rope is around your neck, sign. If the next moment this hall rings with the echo of the falling axe, sign. By all your hopes in life or death, as husbands, as fathers, as men, sign your names to the parchment or be accursed forever. Sign. And not only for yourselves, but for all ages, for that parchment will be the textbook of freedom, the Bible of the rights of man forever. Sign. For that declaration will go forth to American hearts forever, and speak to those hearts like the voice of God. And its works will be will not be done until throughout this wide continent not a single inch of ground owns the sway of a British king. Nay, do not start and whisper with surprise. It is a truth. Your own hearts witness it. God proclaims it. This continent is the property of a free people, and their property alone. 17 second applause God I say proclaims it look at the strange history of a band of exiles and outcasts suddenly transformed into a people look at this wonderful exodus of the oppressed of the old world into the new where they came weak in arms but mighty in godlike faith nay look at this history of your Bunker Hill your Lexington where a band of plain farmers mocked and trampled down the Penelope of British arms and then tell me, if you can, that God has not given America to the free. 12 second applause. It is not given to our poor human intellect to climb the skies to pierce the counsels of the Almighty One, but methinks I stand among the awful clouds which veil the brightness of Jehovah's throne. Methinks I see the recording angel, pale as an angel is pale, weeping as an angel can weep, come trembling up to that throne and speak his dread message. Father, the old world is baptized in blood. 
Father, it is drenched with the blood of millions, butchered in war and persecution, in slow and grinding oppression. Father, look, with one glance of thine eternal eye, look over Europe, Asia, Africa, and behold evermore that terrible sight. Man trodden down beneath the oppressor's feet, nations lost in blood, murder, and superstition, walking hand in hand over the graves of their victims, and not a single voice to whisper hope to man. He there, he stands there, the angel, his hands trembling with the black record of human guilt. But hark, the voice of Jehovah speaks out from the awful cloud. Let there be light again. Let there be a new world. Tell my people, the poor, the trodden down millions, to go out from the old world. Tell them to go out from wrong, oppression, and blood. Tell them, go out from this old world to build my altar in the new. 11 second applause. As God lives, my friends, I believe that to be his voice. Yes, were my soul trembling on the wing of eternity. Were his hand freezing in death. Were this voice choking with the last struggle, I would still, with the last impulse of that soul, with the last wave of that hand, with the last gasp of that voice, implore you to remember this truth. God has given America to the free. Yes, as I sank down into the gloomy shadows of the grave with my last gasp, I would beg you to sign that parchment in the name of the God who made the Savior, who redeemed you. In the name of the millions whose very breath is now hushed in intense expectation as they look up to you for the awful words, you are free. You want to read some? No, I've got some to smoke. <laughs> <clears throat> I'll smoke. Do you want to move? No. <laughs> oh, many years have gone since that hour. The speaker, his brethren, all have crumbled into dust. But it would require an angel's pen to picture the magic of that speaker's look, the deep, terrible emphasis of his voice, the prophet-like beckoning of his hand, the magnetic flame which, shooting from his eyes, soon fired every heart throughout the hall. The work was done. A wild murmur thrills through the hall. Sign. Ha! There is no doubt now. Look how they rush forward, stout-hearted. John Hancock has scarcely time to sign his bold name before the pen is grasped by another, and another, and another. Look how the names blaze on the parchment. Adams and Lee, and Jefferson and Carroll, and now Roger Sherman, the shoemaker. And here comes good old Stephen Hopkins. Yes, trembling with palsy. He totters forward, quivering from head to foot. With his shaking hands, he seizes the pen. He scratches his patriot name. Then comes Benjamin Franklin, the printer. And now the parchment is signed. And now let the word go forth to the people of the streets, to the homes of America, to the camp of Mr. Washington and the palace of George the Idiot King. <laughs> let word go out to all the earth. And, old man in the steeple, now bear your arm and grasp the iron tongue and let the bell speak out the great truth. Fifty-six traders, lawyers, farmers, and mechanics have this day shook the shackles of the world. Hark, hark to the toll of that bell. Is there not a deep poetry in that sound, a poetry more sublime than Shakespeare or Milton? Is there not a music in the sound that reminds you of those awful tones which broke from angel lips? From the news of the child Jesus burst on the shepherds of Bethlehem. For that bell now speaks out to the world that God has given the American continent to the free, the toiling millions of the human race, as the last altar of the rights of man on the globe, the home of the oppressed forevermore. Are we not bought with a price? That's the end of the, of the speech. Um... At the bottom here, it says this reading is taken from the book Washington is, and His Generals, or Legends of the Red Revolution by George Lippard, published in 1847. Manly P. Hall, in his book The Secret Destiny of America, Chapter 17, wrote, Some years ago, while visiting the Theosophical Colony of Ojai, California, A.T. Warrington, Esoteric Secretary at Secretary of the Society discussed with me a number of historical curiosities which led to examination 
of his rare old volume of early American political speeches of a day earlier than those preserved in the first volumes of the Congressional Record. He made particular mention of a speech by an unknown man at the time of the signing of the Declaration of Independence. The particular book was not available at the moment, but Mr. Warrington offered to send me a copy of the speech, and he did, but unfortunately neglected to append the title or the date of the book. He went to India subsequently and died at the Theosophical Headquarters at Adyar in Madras. The end. There's a statement in there that said America was, um, I'm trying to remember exactly what it was, but America, God gave America to the, to the free. The downtrodden, the oppressed. What are the things that tie you to America? Why do you have such a strong devotion towards our country? Why do I? Mm -hmm. I always have. Um, partly that's how I was raised um, and anybody who knows me knows how uh, how defiant of an individual I am I know um, <laughs> um, I'm pretty defiant um, right wrong or <laughs> indifferent I I am a, I am a stubborn, stubborn person. Um, and I really... I really hold that to be very dear, that I have that opportunity, that I have that right to say, no, make me. Um, I'm going to, you know, blaze my own path, as it were. Um, you know, I've always, I've always believed in how great this nation is. I don't know. Perhaps I was born this way. Because um, I have a, I have an understanding of what it means to be free. I have an understanding of, you know, um, what the, what the founders intended. Uh, the great promise of this land. And I think that's been lost on many of us. But, um, because we always we always say in the church, and I talk about this a lot. We always say, um, "Well, we need to honor and uphold the law." Mm, to a certain extent, as long as that law is just and righteous, then yes, we need to honor that law. But that doesn't mean that we honor laws that are unjust and not righteous. One of the things that that brings up in my mind is. It's so much easier as an as an individual to not have to think and to have someone tell you how to what attitude you should have. Oh, we we believe that in being subject to kings, rulers, magistrates. You know that's in our articles of faith. It's easy to believe what you are told to believe. But if we actually truly believe that this life is a time for us to prepare to to grow, prepare to be as God is. A time for us to, to learn to be the way he is. It was in a it was in a conference recently where he said where it was said um, it was two conferences ago I think where they said that it's not sufficient to just do keep the commandments to do what's right. He's like because that's that's what you do when you train animals you train them to do what they're supposed to. And God doesn't want us as dogs at the celestial throne. He doesn't want us trained. He wants us to join in the family business, to learn how to be as he is. You can't just, it's not sufficient to just let your um, attitudes be given to you. You have to have them. You have to own them. They have to be yours. You have to choose them. Use your agency to choose them. Choose with you. No double O, <laughs> only you. <coughs> Um, I was reading, I was doing a little studying earlier this week, and I was reading DNC 98, um, and I'm going to read a little bit out of there. I'm going to start with six. Therefore, I, the Lord, justify you 
and your brethren of my church in befriending that law which is the constitutional law of the land and as pertaining to the law of man whatsoever is more or less than this cometh of evil I the Lord God make you free therefore ye are free indeed and the law also maketh, maketh you free nevertheless when the wicked rule the people mourn so <clears throat> starting in DNC 6 I'll read that again because this this is important what section is that 98, 98. Therefore, I, the Lord, justify you and your brethren of my church in befriending that law, which is the constitutional law of the land. And as pertaining to the law of man, whatsoever is more or less than this cometh of evil. More or less. If you add to it or take from it, it cometh of mm -hmm. evil. Well, and he very specifically, very specifically states befriending that law which is the constitutional law of the land and you know it's the constitution is still relevant the constitution is still important we have to learn it <coughs> excuse me because now arguably more than ever we need it. Absolutely. Um, when, when the Constitution was written and became the law of the land, people were, I don't know, I wasn't there. But I think people were more united in that cause and more united in being a free people. They didn't, they didn't, uh, you know, just go back from a really rough hunting trip they came back from beating back the most powerful empire the world had ever seen and so they knew they knew what it was and what they wanted when it came to being free and i don't think we do you look at everything that's going on they they trample your rights they take your money your property um and it's all under the guise of, you know, this is what's best for society. Well, I don't really give a shit what's best for society. I care what's best for myself and my family and my posterity. And those two things go hand in hand. Because as you improve your situation for your family, as you improve your situation for your posterity, it improves the situation for society. Exactly. And here's what I was thinking about how much we do these days that is part of conforming how much we do these days that is part of fitting into what is is um, normal you could say I mean I, even even things like getting a license getting insurance getting stuff yeah there's things that we should do that are responsible but licensing your car licensing your dog all, all of these little little things that that are done, like you said, in the name of improving society at the expense of the individual. We know that individual liberty is very important. It's the entire premise of this nation. Um, that's, that's God's intent, is individual liberty. I, I mean, we talk about it at church ever ever since we're real tiny we talk about agency the right to choose that as an individual that is paramount to our existence to our our progression because if you're not allowed to choose can you really grow so just say oh okay well i guess this is this is what i'm told to do i guess i better do it or suffer the consequences <clears throat> and they're trying that right now. <clears throat> um, and you you should be upset. I mean, whether you agree with wearing a mask or not is completely irrelevant. <clears throat> For as an example, whether you agree with it or not is irrelevant. 
um, they they should make a recommendation saying you know this is what we recommend but to say the law requires you do this that's taking your agency that's taking your choice which and <laughs> we got the signs all up all over the place here saying um, face masks are required by law well no they're not because the legislature didn't pass that and the gov the governor can't just say oh well this is the law now because that's exactly specifically what this nation was found founded against executive overreach and executive power one of the things that um, they do is they, they try and wear you down and even like I heard a story I think this happened in Canada but basically kids that were at school and their parents um, had done they had done they didn't want to do a coronavirus test or something to that effect and at school the teachers forced the kids to do coronavirus check and the kids came out positive with these these coronavirus checks and then their child protective services took the kids away from the parents and it's like what they said oh the parents were being ne negligent because they weren't taking care of their kids or something to that effect it's like what are you kidding me you you want to do a check to see if your kid has the flu and maybe they do maybe they don't and then if they have the flu you're going to take the kids away from their parents because their parents didn't care to do that check, didn't have faith in that check. What if that check was a false positive? Nobody ever talks about the false positives, but yet you know in can with cancer cases, you know how many people have been diagnosed with cancer and then they get, they get second recommendations and stuff and it turns out that it was a false positive. I had a friend who got, who he was in Romania, he helped a guy, a guy fell off of the, the um, Josh. what do you call it? The, metro into in front of the the train he jumped down and picked him up and threw him back up on the on the platform and jumped up before the train ran him over he got blood all over him he had a cut on his hand he went in and the doctors gave, declared he had aids he had aids just a week after because of that um oh there was blood to blood contact he had aids for about a week and then they, they did several I'm, different I'm checks not a doctor but i don't think that's how that works well, I mean, blood to blood contact is never a good thing. Yeah, it was. It was something. But it was something I don't think you magically just poof AIDS. Well, it, it's like that song. He, he, the, the thing is, the test that they had done, he thought he had AIDS for like a, a week or two, and then found out, oh, he didn't actually have AIDS. He was just, it was a false positive. You have pretend AIDS. Yeah, you got, you got, they call it the cooties. <laughs> but that's what I'm saying is like. If you don't try, if you don't believe 100% in everything that you're told, you're considered a conspiracy theorist. You're considered a, 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 a <laughs> an a enemy to the state. An enemy to the state, and that's because any anything that breaks that um, that model of conformity yeah. is is going to disrupt the whole the whole view of, of all of these things that rely on it. And so that's why it's so dangerous to just consume all of this different media, consume all this different stuff that reiterates and, and, and keeps telling you over and over and over again what you, you're supposed to believe. Hey! Russell wants to talk. What do you have to say, dog? Huh? Huh? <laughs> Don't eat it. <laughs> Damn, you're stupid. <laughs> no, 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 give me some space. Um, you know, I don't know what I was going to say. I forgot. Um, be your own man or woman. Be, I mean, be your own person. Um, don't, don't just cower and don't just conform to the societal norms because that's what it is the societal norm because there's nothing normal about what's happening right now in this whole last year there's nothing normal about what's going on we're having unprecedented power grabs and um, usurpations 
and everybody's like, well, I guess this is just the way it is. Well, no, damn it, that's not just the way it is. And it's not just uh, governmental. It's like my, my daughter was supposed to go to a um, cello lesson yesterday uh, at a school. The, she, 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 she learns cello and stuff, and she's supposed to go to one of her, her group um, practices, and they canceled it because the schools didn't have power. But there wasn't a storm. It wasn't anything. They just said, oh, we don't have power, and we won't have power. And they're like, oh, we got to cancel this. Why? That's, that's, are we, what, what, what nation are we living in? What country are we living in? How, how long? Zimbabwe. Has been, how long has it been since you can't rely on power? How long has it been since you can't rely on water? How long has it been, you know? Yeah, outages happen. I remember growing up, we had a few outages. They had brownouts, we had blackouts. Very rarely did they happen for longer than 30 seconds. An hour, an hour would have been like it was. It would have been me off. They just come in and they update my phone and change the settings that I've set. It's just like with that uh, <clears throat> that emergency text that they sent was last week, two weeks ago, saying, "Oh, COVID cases are out of control. Masks are now required. The governor this, the governor that. Oh, bite me." I don't give two dams what the governor says, and I'll say that to his face. Give me half an opportunity to tell the governor how I feel, and I'll do it. <laughs> oh, you're going to go to jail. For what? That just proves my point. You want to arrest me for speaking my mind. As long as I don't threaten anybody or threaten anything, I am allowed to voice my opinion. So to... <coughs> to my county commissioner all the way up to the president of the United States if I so choose or to a foreign head of state that comes here <laughs> that's the thing is, in this you, country we don't kneel to, to authority that's never been part of this country it's none of the ideals crown. that's none of our ideals no it's not that's, a, that's against what we stand for the entire premise of this nation is being able to stand up and say, no, make me. That's the entire reason for the Second Amendment. Make me. And people say, well, that's, that's kind of dangerous. And they've conditioned you to think that way. They've conditioned you to just say, well, these are the rules and we don't want to cause trouble. They've brainwashed yep. for generations. They brainwash, and if you are like me and have the audacity to speak out and call it what it is, and and anything like that, people will be like, "You're kind of crazy." I'm not crazy. I'm living the life that we were destined to live. I am living the life that that was granted to me, that millions before me have paid for and preserved, and that I myself have paid for and preserved. If anybody has as much of a right to voice their opinions and say something is wrong and this is not what we stand for, I'm one of them. Yeah. So keep your self-righteousness to yourself. I'm going to I'm going to be a free man. that's what we all need to do we all need to stand up and say no more no more you're not going to hear that on the news just a heads up you're not going to hear that ever on the news you won't hear that in a movie maybe, maybe a movie uh, 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 the patriot maybe a movie you'll also see Mel Gibson, Mel Gibson hack a red coat with his tomahawk in front of his kids I bet they never told their dad no again Great movie if you've never seen it. <laughs> Let's watch it together sometime. I, I, think, I know I've seen bits and pieces, but I don't think I've ever seen it. Yeah, it's great. But that's the thing. When you say that they've been brainwashing us for years, for hundreds, I don't know what you said. Generations. Generations. It's true. It's absolutely true. They've used, and our society has been a, what you call a high trust society for a long time where you give people the benefit of the doubt. A, a, a simple, clear way to, to distinguish between 
high trust and low trust is when you have a transaction, when you sell something. Um, for instance, in Romania, it was covered by, it, it, was, it was communist for over 50 years. Ceausescu was the dictator. In communism, it doesn't work. The government is not efficient enough to get the people what they need, and they try to. They take everything from everybody and then try to give out people based off what they need. My what they deem that you need. Exactly. My father-in-law, he was getting rations of gasoline. He didn't have a car. What did he do with that gasoline? He went out to the countryside and he traded it to the farmers so that he could get chickens. Little chickens or turkeys or ducks. What? Ducklings? They bring them in. What did he do? In his big seven-story apartment, or the seventh-floor apartment on a, in a 10, 15-story block, two-bedroom apartment, he would raise them in the bathtub. Why? So they could have meat. Because if you waited in the meat lines, you were you were not going to get it unless you were there for literally days. And when you got it, you were going to get rancid meat. Why? Because the government didn't have the ability to do that. What I'm getting at, though, is... Where's I even going with this? Government is not the answer. Yes. I assume that's what you were getting at. What were we talking about before? There was something that... There was a, there was a point. I don't know... <laughs> you were talking about communism and gasoline for chickens and raising them in bathtubs. Right, but that was that was I was steering to something. You were steering to madness. I don't know what you just said. What? I said you were steering to madness. Well, basically, what I was getting at though is um, the 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 brainwashing that we're going through. Um, oh yeah, brainwashing. <laughs> where uh, high trust and low trust—that's where I was. Going. Yeah. Um, we, yeah. We've, we've been being brainwashed, and we've um, for a long time we've been a high trust society where we give people the benefit of the doubt. A low trust society does not do that. Um, the way that you can tell the difference, one of the a clearest way that I've been able to see, is when there's transactions when people go to buy something. Do you do the people try to? Um, negotiate? Do they try to, uh, do you feel like if you haven't negotiated, if you haven't like negotiated people down, you're getting screwed over? In a, in a high trust society, you give people, you trust people to sell it for what it's worth. If they don't, if they screw you over, you take no and you stop buying from them. You just, you, you, they, you, they, you, they become scum to you. In a low trust society, it's all about trying to win in screwing someone over. It's like, oh, he tried to sell it for this, but I got him down to this. And oh, he was, he thought that it was worth this much and I got that. And, and it's, it's just the, the attitude that they have towards each other. In, here in the States, here in, in our country, it was built off of, in, off of Christian values that is a high trust attitude that gives people the benefit of the doubt. The media, the um, politics, that they have, they've known that and they've feed it off of that. They've used that against you. They've used that, your, your goodwill towards your fellow man, they've used against you. It's, it's been used to make you think that, oh, the government would never do that. Too many people would have to go along with that. Or, oh, that's, people just don't do that. You know, good people don't. But not all people are good people. And if you, if you blindly believe that they are, then you're, you're, you're allowing yourself to be brainwashed. I'm not, I'm not a cynic by any means. There are tons of good people, millions of good people on this earth. There are people, most people that you come in contact with are good, if they're given the chance. But, that being said, the people who seek out power, the people who seek out authority over you, they're not usually good. There's a reason they seek out power. They're kingdom. And that's what they want. They want to follow this idea that you have to take away agency <clears throat> to give to make, to make to, people do the right thing to make people do the right thing it's the same war we fought before this world it all comes back to that agency is is it good to let people make choices yes are people going to make bad choices yeah yes that's that's part of life that's part of why we're here and that that war is still going on today Man needs to be afforded the opportunity to make mistakes. And if nobody made mistakes, nobody would grow. That's, that's what you I grow saying. from other people's mistakes as well. Like our friendship. 
total mistake. Mm-hmm. Haunts my dreams. Um, yeah. There's a lull. You want dancers? Or <laughs> what? Here's something that I do want. And, and more of, instead of just us talking to the camera, I'm, I'm curious, Mitch, what is it that um, makes you stay patriotic? What is it that gives you that patriotism? Because like, we talked to this about a, a while ago, and it was, it was a brief conversation, but I remember talking about how the, the ideas that we deem patriotic, like the proud to be an American songs, and the, the, the flag, and the eagle, and the, these things that have these deep ties to us in our patriotism, there, there's value there, but also if we're putting those in front of the Constitution, if we're putting those in front of the, the things that make this country what it is, like what, where, what's the correct attitude? You know. <clears throat> well, the, to me, I love the flag. I love I our flag. Um, to me, it's about what it represents, the promises, the back off, dude. The, the promises um, that it represents, the greatness that it represents, not just through <coughs> our uh, military, military or economic strength, but the promise that all men are created equal. All men. From, you know, black to white to purple to gay, straight, um, all men are created equal, regardless. And also, from from the military side, the great sacrifices that have been made on behalf of other people. The things that the American warfighter has done for you know, over 200 years now has all been about <clears throat> somebody else. It's been about sacrificing and doing these things for somebody else. Whether that's still what we do in the military or not, that's when it comes down to the individual level of the people overseas fighting. That's, you know, it's that's what it is. That's what drives them. Yeah. So... For people to say that there's nothing special about America or Americans aren't more special than anybody else, I say that's bullshit. For, well, we've really only ever fought two wars for ourselves. Well, three. The Revolutionary War, the War of 1812, and the Civil War. Everything else has been World War One, World War Two, Vietnam, and the real reasons for fighting in Vietnam or or Iraq and Afghanistan. Now we will probably never know, but <coughs> there there was an interest in fighting in World War One and World War Two. I mean, um, but that's still comes down to it was about fighting to liberate and save everybody else because I don't think anybody is going to try and invade the United States just looking at it logistically it's all but impossible because it's so wide and so spread out but you know <clears throat> hundreds of thousands of Americans have died for other people it's that ideal. It's not. It's not because this is what the government told us to do. It's there's been a cause. There's been a reason. I think that it's it's important to realize, like we that unity that you mentioned earlier, mm -hmm. if we're not united, 
then what are we? We're, we're nothing. We, if the whole system falls apart quickly when we don't be mm -hmm. united. That's one of the reasons why this corruption, this um, shenanigans that have been going on, is such a bad thing. Is because you can't unite with something that's wrong, that's bad. Good people don't unite with evil. <coughs> and when you get people who realize how evil some of the stuff is that's going on, when you get into, I mean, even to, into like the abortion up, abortion. Oh, abortion up until even the day of a birth. Yeah, that's okay. You get you get people that um, if 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 we continue to allow in the name of tolerance or in the name of um, equality equality, if we allow evil in those false pretenses then you can't have unity. And that, that disunity is going to cause war. It's going to cause a civil war. It's, it's one of those things that you need to be aware of and be, be um, ready for. That's why one of the reasons why we talk about being prepared. And it's not, we're, we're not trying to be alarmists or doom and gloomers. I, I am very positive for our future. Um, the thing that keeps me positive is because I know God is at the helm. I know that as long as I keep my family going towards Him, we'll be okay. Doesn't mean that the country's going to be okay. Doesn't mean that things are going to go well. It doesn't mean it's going to be easy. But I know that I, keeping my family going towards Him will result in good eventually. I know that keeping others encouraging others to be good one of the things here's here's one of the things that i think has has sustained our friendship mitch i have the belief that a true friend is someone who makes it easier for you to live the way god wants you to live the, to follow christ mitch you're always a friend of mine who regardless of what you did or how you acted you knew the values that i held for myself and you helped me live them you helped me live them and regardless of whether you agreed with them or not, you were like, oh, you don't do that. You, don't be stupid. That's what I do. How many times have I said that to you? <laughs> yeah. That's what I do. <laughs> but a true friend is someone who makes it easier for you to follow Christ. Be true friends out there. Be true friends to those around you. Make it easier for others to, to stand up for what's right. Encourage that wherever you can. That's Let's, how we win this, this, this conflict, is by turning our nation, back to our, the hearts of our nation, back to God. Do the right thing. Always do the right thing. Whether it costs you societal points, who, get, who cares? You, the main goal of this life should not be to be liked. I mean, if people like you, great. But you can do the right thing and you can stand for your beliefs and your principles and you can stand firm in that and they can be unpopular and people can still like you and people will respect you. I, I hold a lot of beliefs that are unpopular with a lot of people. Me too. <laughs> um, and you know what? I People still respect me. They may tease me and give me a hard time but I stand firm in my beliefs and my convictions and my principles I stand firm in those and I don't waver I don't back down from them and yeah if somebody doesn't like me tough shit I don't really care my main purpose in this life is to not be liked um but you and, actually, you want to be disliked? Is that, am I understanding that? Sometimes. <laughs> Depends on who it is. <laughs> I don't care to be disliked. Um, but I'm just one of those, I'm just one of those people that I just, I do, I do me. And you'll either like that and accept that or not. That's not my problem. I'm responsible for what I do. I'm not responsible for how you take it. And how you react to that. That's not my problem. That's your problem. Be strong in your convictions and do the right thing regardless of what anybody's 
what anybody thinks. Integrity. Integrity. Do the right thing even when nobody's watching. That's one thing, one of the many things that our society is lacking is integrity. If we don't have integrity, we, we're going to fall. Here's the thing that's sad about that. We need loyalty, too. There's a lot... Of, I'm sorry to interrupt. <laughs> You're good. There's, there's a lot of people who want to do the right thing, but they don't want to be seen as a goody two sure. They don't want to be seen as, uh, <clears throat> you know, they, 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 they don't... They want to do the right thing, but they don't want to be seen doing the right thing. And so, in public, they'll act worse than they actually are. And that's a form of, I mean, it's a form of hypocrisy, just the same as in public acting better than you actually are. They're both hypocritical. It's important to do the right thing when people are not watching. It's also important to do the right thing when people are watching, because people need to see others doing the right thing. Because if you don't think, if you don't know what the right thing is, or if you don't know kind of how to do the right thing, you don't know which way to go, sometimes you need someone who's like, I'm going to do this because this is what's right. You need someone to, that, that is willing to stand up for what's right. And when you see what's right, it resonates with you. It's like, oh, that is right. I'm going to do that too. It makes it easier for others to do the right thing when you choose to do the right thing deliberately, whether you're in public or private. And that's, that's how you spread good. That's how you spread God. That's how you, that's how you be a missionary. It's by doing the right thing all the time. You become someone who's better. If you want people to to trust you, you need to be trustworthy. You don't just do the things that build trust. You be trustworthy. If you want to be loyal, if you need people to be loyal, you have to be a loyal person yourself. Sorry, go ahead. Uh, continue on with loyalty. Because I know I interrupted your thought. Um, I was just saying, loyalty is very important it goes back to being uh you know a man of your word your word is your bond it goes back to that but i mean really without without loyalty what are you i mean you're loyal blown, you're blown around like Gosh. a ship that has no anchor on a, on a stormy sea yeah you're, you're, a fair, you're a fair weather friend you're great when the times are great but when someone needs you, you're nothing. You're, you're nowhere to be seen. Loyal, um, yeah, loyalty. No. <laughs> Touche. <laughs> Lo uh, loyalty is just one of those things that I hold very, very dear. If you're not, if you're not loyal, I mean, I won't be unkind to you, but I won't really. go out of my way to be friends with you or you know really treat treat you very good sometimes <laughs> but but that's just one of those things loyalty is one of those core values <coughs> that you should have um loyalty is everything loyalty and integrity if you if you try to build a relationship that doesn't have loyalty, the relationship won't stand when troubles come. It just, it, it won't. If you try to build a, I mean, that's with friends, that's with your spouse, or, um, or even your kids. If they, if they believe that once you do something, once they do something wrong, you're gonna not love them anymore, your kids are not gonna have that loyalty towards you. Because they don't, because they, they don't reciprocate it. it it's, it's been interesting to me. There's, there's scriptures that say, um, we love God because he loved us first. I'm trying to remember exactly where that was, but um, I always thought that that was an interesting way of thinking. We love God because he loved us first. And I didn't know if I agreed with it for a long time. And not, not that I disagreed with it, but I didn't understand it. I didn't understand it. And I don't say that I do now, but this year I've, I think I've come to appreciate it more. Um, I've appreciated it more as I've, as I've specifically looked at my relationship with my kids. Um, I, I'm very clear with my kids when, whenever they do something wrong, I'm very clear with them. Like, this isn't going to make me stop, stop loving you. I will Play always time. love you. There's nothing that you can do that will make me stop loving you. 
I'm not happy with you right now. This was not good and you need to do better. But it's always very clear my love doesn't change. The love is, is unconditional. And I noticed, especially with my son, he's three, I've noticed him um, understand that, oh, when, when something goes wrong, he's, he has that love. And it's, I've seen it empower him and I've seen it strengthen him. And to some degree, it's, it's helped me realize more why me loving God simply because he loved me first is not a bad thing. It's not a, it's not a, a weird thing. It's just, that's just the way that love works. And that's why when you love your, your kids, it needs to be unconditional. When you love your spouse, it needs to be unconditional. Your friends, you need to love unconditionally. Those people around you that you don't like, charity is, is hard for a reason. You need to love them. And that doesn't mean be okay with everything they do that's wrong. That doesn't mean enable their bad behavior. Th th those are not what it means. But it means you want the best for them, no matter what. You want the best for, for their lives. You want them to find happiness. You want them to, to, to find the things that, that will bring them true joy. That's what love is. And it's, it's not always easy, especially with the people that, that you don't like and that you disagree with. Yeah. What? Uh, what are you snickering about? <laughs> oh, it's just funny. I'm just blindly agreeing I wasn't listening. Yeah, I figured that's why I was laughing. That's like, I, I, I know I've been talking too long because Mitch is he's thinking about guns right now. <laughs> no, I was playing with the fire. <laughs> I love guns. Guns are cool. They go bang. I was shooting at it 700 yards yesterday. In high wind. And it was blowing my bullets everywhere. <laughs> I was I was shooting one of my ARs at it. At 700 yards and the wind was blowing like a SOB. And so my, my optics graduated for different... Um, ranges mm -hmm. and so I'm holding it on 700 and I send that round and, and I'm watching it through the watching through the scope watching the target and all of a sudden I see <laughs> way up high the wind was blowing my bullets up <laughs> so I'm like oh damn I haven't seen that for for a hot minute I mean granted 223 is really light um, and I'm shooting <laughs> through this little valley <laughs> and so I hold it on 600 and I'm like okay so I'm shooting at 600 and the wind will you know it's not constant it's gusting and stuff so I never ended up hitting the plate at all yesterday <laughs> how'd that make you feel? okay because they were all really close and high wind <laughs> so yeah oh well um because I was shooting at it with my M1A with iron sights Yeah, well, it sucks to not be perfect, doesn't it? Anyway, so yes. I let my let yes, my. It does. <laughs> it does suck to not be perfect, bitch. Yeah, well, I wouldn't know. That's life. I let my buddy um, take my rifle and try it. I said, "Hold it at 600." The wind's blowing the bullets up, so he's holding it on the 600 mark, and he shoots, and it does it again. It goes <laughs> way high. So he holds it up 500, and he starts landing them pretty close. He's like, holy crap. He's like, yeah, I haven't seen the wind blow a bullet up for a long time either. But, I mean, this little valley that we're shooting through, um, it's up in the mountain. And the hill comes down like this. So there's a little valley, and then it comes back up. So that wind's coming down and going back up. And the target, the plate that we're shooting at specifically is... <clears throat> right by where the hill is about to come back up and so you know the wind it was it was fun we felt well you know at least in the high wind I could keep somebody's head down <laughs> <laughs> I 
practice shooting at, at different distances. Um, what else do you want to talk about? How long have we been doing this? Those poor people still. It's 8, 8 16. I don't know. It was after 6. I don't know. I don't know. It's not my job to keep the time. Hey, sit down. In my ass. There's always, there's always reasons to, uh, to dislike people, or like, I don't know, just to have disagreements with people. There's this, there's oh, I dislike people. I, so, this week, twice I've gone into town, about 6, 6.30, I'm driving around. There's people everywhere, and every single one of them's dumber than a box of shit. Oh my gosh. I'm driving. The speed limit's 55. And people are going 45. Yeah, I realize it's dark, but I mean, good lord, you got headlights on your vehicle. The deer aren't down in the valley starting to sprint across the road yet at 6.30. You're such an angry person. I... Oof, people are stupid. Here's my recommendation. If you're not competent enough to go the speed limit, stay your ass home. I found that it's hard for people to follow simple directions. If you can't put on your blinker, stop driving. I only do that when there's not people behind me. You don't use your blinker hardly ever. I use my blinker all the time! Except for when you need it. <laughs> like you said, oh shit! <laughs> <laughs> I have to turn here. You put your blinker on? <laughs> no. I don't use my blinker out and around when I'm cruising around home because there's nobody else on the road if there's other people behind me or in front of me or whatever I use my blinker but if there's nobody else around what the hell's the point right right That's I don't need to let nobody know that I'm turning I don't go the speed limit unless there's people around usually I'll go 20 30 under I'll punch you if I ever get stuck behind you and you're doing that, I swear, I, can't wait. I swear to God, I will rear end you so you have to get out and I will punch you in your face. Douchebag. <laughs> <laughs> you know, sometimes I like to just drive around town just a little bit, five, six, seven miles under speed limit, <laughs> just so that people have an opportunity to, to forgive. That's not my strong suit. I don't know. I, 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 <laughs> mostly, I like to dance on the fire. I don't. I don't really actually do that. You are that. so whiny. Stop it. Nobody cares. <laughs> Nobody cares. There's no reason for you to be whiny. I think you're projecting that much. <laughs> I just want people to drive the damn speed limit. <laughs> I don't think that's too much to ask. I mean, it wasn't raining, it wasn't snowing, nothing. There's no reason for people to be going so damn slow. What the hell is wrong with you? Oh. Well, it's the speed limit. It means you can't go any faster than that. Bullshit! <laughs> the speed limit means you go that at least that damn fast. I don't you know, like other people. I don't like having to deal with other people. When our founding fathers created this country, there was no speed limits. That's right. <laughs> well, the problem is, is where I live is all these jackasses are moving are moving here from, you know, from from south where, you know, it's getting too crowded down there. So what's the next best option? Oh, let's move somewhere else and dick that all up. And so we have all these two lane roads and people are like, yeah, whatever, I'll just go however fast I want. This is country, nobody cares. No, jackass, I do care. Take your slow driving ass back to wherever the hell you came from. You screwed it up there, fix it. 
Just like all these jackasses from California that move everywhere else. <laughs> they move everywhere else because they want to get they want to get away from, you know, the nightmare that they've created there. And then they go and they mess everything else up everywhere that they go. Yep. And then they're surprised that it's changed. It's social locusts. And then people are, well, why, why, why are you so angry? I don't know, because you came here and tried to dictate how I live my life instead of you conforming to where you chose to go. It's just the thing. I mean, if you leave somewhere <clears throat> in search of a better life because you don't like the things that are the way that you go, don't go and vote for the same stupid shit that you voted for in the last place. Would there be something wrong with not um, allowing people to vote until they lived in a place for a certain <laughs> amount of time? Yes. Like five years? Unfortunately. Why? What would be wrong with that? Like, what would be bad about that? You taking away somebody's say as to how they are represented? No, you're not. You're just requiring them to, to live there for, before they actually can say. I think that if you don't like things the way that they are where you are, you should fix it. I agree. I agree. But that, that, I think that, that that's one of the problems that um, right now that you're describing, though, is people, oh, like California. People are leaving California in droves. Oh, and man. They're, um, California, even, they're, even California has come out saying, we're going to charge taxes to people who leave this country for five years after they leave, or this state for five years after they leave the state or something like yeah, that. Yeah, you can't do that. Yeah, I know, but that's what they're, that's what they're trying to do. And they're, they, they're, ba they're, they're doing some crazy, crazy stuff because they, they need the people who they've, they've chased out. Well, stop having such stupid social programs and stop... I don't know. Here's the other thing about freaking California. Mm -hmm. So, California has all these laws and rules and regulations about, for example, EPA requirements on vehicles in California. Well, that forces all these EPA requirements and regulations on, <coughs> on me two states away when... I don't really see it as a necessity. California loves to to bitch and complain about air quality when, you know, all summer long we had smoke from their fires all over here because of their poor environmental policies. Let's not let's not clean out the dead, you know, deadfall in the forests and and there's actually evidence that their little environmentalist psychopaths go through and will cut up the their old power poles so when the wind comes it blows them down sparks fires and stuff so they can get their new green energy well it's also interesting how like there there would have been fires in places where the governments needed to buy land that's like for for the what was it the that uh super bullet train whatever thing that they're trying to put in they've been trying oh. to put it in for it's 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 highway robbery it's it so in in romania what the the Orthodox Church would do is they would um, they would start building a, a cathedral and then they'd stop halfway through and the priests would go around and they'd beg for money to the local people around and then they'd build up a, a few more another layer or do something else but then they'd stop and they basically they they, they drag this, these projects out for years and years and years for decades um, so that they could keep getting mo more money from the people for these cathedrals and I, I um, y you can see the same thing in our politics now it's just uh, the they they'll have a program and they'll be like oh but we need more money to get it to actually work we can't get it to work yet it's like it's because it's the program's designed to fail and um, there were, there was I don't know just going on there, I think but you should you should always be suspicious of anybody who wants to get you to do something one of my favorite things is when people say oh the government wouldn't do that really there isn't anything the government wouldn't do you you're just not smart. <laughs> it's, it's Go away. Nice, it's I'm going to put nice you back in the truck. That the government would never do that. But, but it's just not true. It's just simply not true. I mean, it's, it's documentably not true. When you talk about like false flags and stuff like that, they've come out and revealed many false flags that our government has done or covered up that other countries have done against us. And it's like the government does not have your best interest in mind. The government is a bureaucracy that is its interest is perpetuating its own bureaucracy yes it's an entity and it's like if you don't if, if you are stuck in this idea of oh uh 
Republicans versus Democrats, or the right versus left, or you know, there there's there's truth to the, to the ideologies, but in general, it's the people versus the government. It's not it's not a, a the, the difference between the individuals and the citizens is far smaller. People want to be safe. They they want the police to have the ability to stop bad people. They want to support our, our military so that we can be safe. They want to be left alone. They they want they want they'll choose their 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 safety over their privacy. No, I I think that that's. Often I think most people will. Excuse. Well, safety is one of those things that people have stopped making their own personal um, responsibility. Well, people just stop thinking about it. it's. If you say safe. Um, it's it's kind of like insurance. Um, people don't realize that insurance doesn't protect you from getting hurt. That's not the job of insurance. Insurance, the job of insurance is to mitigate risk. If you get hurt, there's a there's there's a fund there to help you pay for it. Mm-hmm. But but insurance doesn't inherently protect you. And people are like, oh, I'll die if I don't have this insurance. It's like, you're gonna die anyways. One, but two, <laughs> like uh, <laughs> that's just the fact of it. I'm not I'm not trying to be like sadistic or. It's anything, just but, funny how you say it. Well, you're going to die anyway. <laughs> but the insurance doesn't actually stop you from dying. Getting hurt or getting sick or something will cause you to die. And insurance is just an idea that it does nothing except for pays for stuff if if it's done right. But but the whole idea of insurance has been shoved down our throats that people associate that with your safety. And it's like, well, that's not true. Same with safety in general. It's like, oh, we have to protect against these. Um, all I'll the just people. call the cops. Good luck. Yeah, that, that doesn't work that way. But when you have things like in Philadelphia, where the cops were ran out of the, some of the sectors, or, or, or did you? Are you familiar with what happened a few? This happened before the, the this week, but no. Basically, um, the, the 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 cops were run out of. Um, they they were run out of. There was a mob, and they were run out of the um, their jurisdiction. They basically their 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 building that they had. I, I saw some of the videos. I don't remember all the details off the top of my head, but the built their their. I don't know if it's precinct. I don't know if it's. I don't know the right terminology. But the building that they had to have all their stuff in. Their, 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 oh, this happened in Wash. This happened in a couple of places. Yeah, but they but the, the cops had to leave and they they evacuated and the and the the um, ch- police chief was basically like. Yeah, we seeded the the ground, you know, and it's like, wait, what? You seeded it to who? And it was, it was to a mob. It was to people who were mobbing. What kind of a precedent does that set? Exactly. That's one of those things that people ask me. They're like, how do you feel about it? I'm like, well, I don't know. This is a tough one because obviously um, those in authority shouldn't just be killing people (laughs) but but at the same time they are acting as um an an offensive force i mean they should be able to treat it just like they would the house as soon as they can as just like they would if somebody were to break into your house as soon as you force your way through that threshold you get shot if you're going to try and throw molotovs at the building and burn it down you're going to get shot I mean, those are clear, active, hostile threats. If somebody's just throwing rocks at the building, whatever, who cares? I mean, personally, to a point. To a point, but that—that's where I would say it's okay to draw that line, and you're clear to engage. You bust through that door, whether you're armed or not. I don't know what your intentions are. Obviously, you are a threat because you broke you, you broke through some kind of barrier to keep you out. So. You know, I have no idea what your intentions are. I'm going to assume that your intentions are to harm myself <coughs> or somebody else. So, yeah, you break through the door, shoot them. I'm cool with that. I mean, officers have the right to protect their, their own lives. And, um, you know, there's got to be a, um, a line for protecting society in general. But, you know, I don't think that we should just be freaking laying machine gun fire into mobs and rioters they need to be dealt with but i mean it's not what this country is about just killing dis- dissidents yeah. though if it were us they'd probably be like oh hell yeah just kill them you see what those people did 
They're enemies to the state. Uh, we don't really do that here. That's the idea. Is like, like the state is... It's all-powerful, all-knowing entity. It's a nothing. All-caring. All That's the way it's supposed to be. I know. The more power that we, we see to it, the, the more foolish we are. Well, that's just the thing. People are like... But no, they couldn't have possibly meant that. No, that's what they meant. Pretty much just leave the people alone and they'll do the right thing. Yeah. That's, that's, that's what's so awesome about like the whole concept of malicious. It's like, okay, to have, to have malicious be one of the go-tos for how your are your protecting itself. It's like the people. Yeah. And what do you think about, is it the, what's the, um, is it... McCartney doctrine, the doctrine that got it, that basically said we don't do, um, we don't get into politics in Europe, in the Northern Hemisphere. And, uh, I don't care about Europe. That's I know. That, <laughs> that, do you know what I'm saying? Do you, do you know what the, the what I'm the thing I'm referencing? No, nope, I don't care about Europe. We um, it we we lived by this doctrine until like the World War One, I, I think. But basically, it, we we were not engaged in any. Um, in any wars when there was oh, wars in, yeah 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 in Europe and stuff like that we we didn't take sides and we didn't um, we weren't involved we basically like you guys work it out we'll mm -hmm. sell to both sides the, our goods and our services mm -hmm. we're gonna be neutral we're a neutral party and and that's that's one of the things that helped our country to grow to what it it became is that idea that you know we're we're not in the world I, we're, we're just going to do our own thing. We're just going to be left alone and do our mm -hmm. own thing. And right now, we don't have that at all. And the whole the whole motivation behind, like, the Patriot Act and the whole motivation behind, like, this spying on the citizens and all that stuff is, oh, we got to make sure that we know what bad people are doing to us and stuff like that. And it's like, that's... If you don't have anything to hide, then why do you care? Well... Mm, because it's the principle... That's that's the whole thing. People are like, well, if you don't have anything to hide, then why do you care? In a, in a, in because this, it's wrong. In this digital age, if you don't have... So, just for example, your um, your emails that you send, if they're not, if you don't own them, like if they're not on your personal server, the government doesn't need to get a warrant to, to read through them. You know? They don't need to get a warrant to, to procure them and to, to read them. If, if they're, you're just using Gmail or something like that, the government has free right to, to get them because of the, the way that they've interpreted the privacy laws. The privacy is, is one of those things that is very... Um, you know why privacy wasn't, wasn't put into the Bill of Rights? Because it's assumed. Because it's assumed. It's, it, it was Exactly. Natural. You have a right to privacy. The saying that was on our currency originally was, mind your business. So, the right to privacy is assumed as a natural, just a given. They almost didn't put the Second Amendment in, in the Bill of Rights because it was an assumed. It was a, a, a given. And it's a good thing that they did because we wouldn't have it at this point. Look at how well that's worked out in Australia and England. Yep. That's one of the things that this country um, really does have to shush to to protect against the full-fledged tyranny. Is that when full-fledged tyranny will be attempted, which it will, and it is being attempted in degrees right now. Um, but the thing that protects us is our ability to protect ourselves. As long as. As long as you own arms and are, you know, somewhat competent in being able to defend yourself, you're truly free. I mean, yeah, you'll if the ATF or the FBI or whoever shows up at your door and is demanding this, that, or the other thing under threat of force, yeah, you're ultimately going to lose if you're by yourself. But, I mean, you're still, you still have that choice to... You know, say, make me. Do you mean, you, I know you say that because you look at, like, Waco. 
Explain what happened with Rinko. Because I'm not as familiar. I'm not as, I'm not entirely sure what happened that led up to this. The ATF thought that they were dealing arms. And the whole, the whole thing that started this was, um, they had some empty, empty grenades, um, inert grenades or some, something, something stupid, um, shipped to their compound and the, the delivery driver saw it and called the ATF and the ATF's like, oh, these religious people living all by themselves out in the middle of Texas must be up to do, up to something wrong. Automatically assumed. Automatically notes. assumed when there was no evidence of a crime having been committed because, I mean, hell, you could buy fake grenades and, um, you know, the demilled grenades online. So the ATF shows up and they're going to try and um, issue a search warrant or serve, serve a search warrant or whatever. And they were, I mean, the people in Waco were armed. And so anyway, all that started. Somebody sh fired a shot. I think the ATF shot a dog and that's why you see all the ATF dog memes. Oh, is that right? <laughs> I, yeah. How long anyway, ago was this? This was in the 90s. This was during the ja Janet Reno Justice Department. Um, I don't know who anyway, she was the, um, shit, what's it called? DOJ. Uh, say the position that Eric Holder had, what the hell is it? Uh, accounting general. Yeah. Attorney general. Accounting general. Attorney general. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. That's, that's so, right. yeah. So, anyway. The ATF comes screaming in. Um, this little firefight ensues. People get shot. People get killed. <coughs> and so they end up laying siege onto this. These poor people in Waco for a couple months. Um, and anyway, it ends up that the FBI and the ATF are responsible for killing all these people without any evidence of a crime having been committed. Zero evidence. So that's why I say the AT if the ATF or the FBI show up at your house, I'm not saying, you know, pick fights. But what? that's why I use that as an example. At least you have the means and the ability to, yeah, you're going to die, but you have that opportunity to die um, on your own terms. As long as you have that, you're free and you can say, make me. That's the point. That's the intent. In academia, one of the things that they do to propagate a, an idea is they, they don't fight against the ideas they don't like. They simply, you know, every year they're printing out new books. They're printing out new um, manuals and they make the kids buy new manuals and stuff like that. And everybody complains about that. The pernicious thing about that is they just take the stuff that they don't want to propagate out of the new manuals and they just re-educate people. They don't re-educate people, they just change their education and, and omit anything that doesn't fit the narrative that they're trying to suit. This same thing happens, I was just thinking this, this whole story of, with Waco, I don't know it. I was like, why don't we learn that in history? Why don't we learn that in like school? Why don't we learn that? In, I mean... Who, can, who controls education? Exactly, that's, that's what I'm getting at. They're not going to teach you the things they don't want you to know. They're not going to teach you when they were in the wrong. Exactly. Waco, Ruby Ridge, uh, Mulholland Wildlife Refuge in Oregon when they just killed Lavoie Finicum a few years ago. Was that when the the, uh, the Bureau of Land Management had that overreach? Yeah. And there was a basically the guy had the contract and he was um, he he was within his rights and then they were like, no, you can't be on this land. No, no, that was in Nevada. That was with Bundy. Yeah. It, the one in Oregon was a rancher was burning fields or something, clearing brush. I don't remember, but it ended up spreading, <coughs> spreading to federal land. And if I remember right, the rancher and his son were able to put it out by themselves. Mm -hmm. But the the feds still charged them and put them in prison, and they ended up getting released early. 
but a grand jury, I guess, re-indicted them and were bringing, telling them that they had to go back to prison, which is unconstitutional. And everybody's like, no, this is wrong. And that's what sparked that whole thing. Oh. So, given the, the details and the circumstances, yes, the people were within their rights to form a militia and say no. But, I mean, choose your, choose your freaking bites. I mean, it's just, if you look at the FBI specifically since its founding, you're going to find all sorts of instances of overreach and foul abuse play. and foul play. I mean, and, I mean the, if you tell the FBI no, you're going to you're gonna die. The people that, um, the, the uh, what's his name? Martin Luther King Jr. His family still claims that the FBI killed it, Martin Luther King Jr. Probably. I would not hold it past the United States government at all. It's like the, the Our form of government is pure. The way things are supposed to work is right. It's been perverted. Usurped. And that's I think that's where people have a hard time with that disconnect is this is the way it's supposed to be, but this is what they do. And so the system is flawed. Well, the system's not flawed. You've sent terrible people to represent you and I mean is a good is a bad person gonna choose a good person to be the head of a department no they're gonna choose some other crooked spineless piece of shit some person they can control or have dirt on or I mean I was I was looking into there I'm trying to remember exactly what it is but they're um, the, the I'm trying to remember the name of it it's similar to blackmail but basically extortion what, no it's not that there's huh. what they'll do is they will um, get these new congressmen or these new people that are like kind of high on the oh they're excited they're in Washington they're they're you know and they'll they'll they will get some um, person to basically seduce them at bars and stuff like that and they'll um, then they'll take them back to hotel rooms and then they'll drug them or do something or get them to do something nefarious on their own or um, or put them in a situation that's compromising where and then they'll leave them with pictures of them doing something with kids or doing something horrific you know and they'll leave them with those pictures and they're like okay when we need you we have you and and when they um basically they use that as a form of control over and and then it turns into blackmail it turns into these things where it's like when when people are not when people allow themselves to be compromised they're not going to be you, you they can't be um act for their own interest or for the interest of those who they're supposed to represent and um everybody everybody knows that it, it's it's one of those problems with not having um, moral people in government and it's hard to find people moral enough to do that because they're the the the, the wicked are out trying very hard to find those vices trying very hard to find those things that they can use to control someone because the Satan's always going to use your weaknesses and try and reveal them in the most inopportune way possible um, or make you fail, fall and fail and, and be, become wicked. Your, your, your sins will always be used against you. That's one of the reasons why I believe that our country is, is, is so important. It's the, the separation of church and state is important on a, on a um, structural level, but there should not be a, a separation between church and, and our nation. Yeah. The people need to have Christ as their head. Kneel only to Christ, not to kings, not to the president, not to your mayor. You don't kneel to those people. Those are people. We'll go back. Go. We'll go back to DNC ninety eight. Um, nine. Nevertheless, when the wicked rule, the people mourn. Yes. And we all. It also says. Um, uh, verse ten. Wherefore. Honest men and wise men should be sought for diligently, and good men and wise men ye should observe to uphold. Otherwise, whatsoever is less than these cometh of evil. I've learned a lot since we started doing these. Since we started doing this, um, I learned um, how imp how important it is to vote for the right person. Um, you know, we're accountable for all things um, to the Father. 
and you know I've realized that um, it's just our vote is one of those things that we will be held accountable for um, not voting for the right person not voting for you know um, not necessarily just what you believe but what for what we know is right the platforms what the what the parties represent what the the people themselves represent um, will be held accountable for the way that we vote and you should not vote for what's best for you but what's going to be best for your posterity that is um, that's paramount you know it, what's best for posterity because we have said it before I'll say it again and I'm sure I'll say it a million more times we owe it to our posterity to pass down something worth passing down otherwise we're complicit just like we're in this mess because of the sins of previous generations we're in these chains and shackles so shall our posterity be if we don't do what's right and we have to break the chains of the two party system I mean, it's not hard to see how corrupt both sides are. Both sides are only interested in their own power and their own authority. They're not interested in you. Seek out the third the third party options. Like I said before, look into the Constitution Party, look into the Libertarian Party. Um, find those um, platforms that resonate not just with you but for freedom for liberty um i like i said i'm a registered republican but truthfully i'm a constitutionalist i like being a registered republican because i have a say in you know in the primaries and the caucuses i have a say and then ultimately when <laughs> they just do whatever the hell they want anyway i can just do whatever i want but That's one of those things that I don't think that we we think about enough that we are going to be held accountable for. It was a really neat um, David O. McCabe. He told he relayed a story to I think it was a facilities committee. Basically, he was he was, they were after a meeting and he was um, talking about um, a personal priesthood interview that we will have with Christ um, after we die. And he's like, each member of the priesthood will hold this interview with Christ. And he said, if you're interested, I'll tell you the questions he asks and the order in which he asks them. And I believe he gives six questions. But um, one of the questions was, what have you done to better your community, your country, and the world? And that's, I think, the... the I don't know if that's the last question. I think it is. But um, what are we doing to make this a better place? What are we doing to better the lives of... Of, of our posterity. What are we doing for those things? Christ is going to ask you that. What are you going to answer? Goes back to doing the right thing. This, I haven't, I don't think I've told very many people this. There's only, there's only literally one or two people who actually know this that I can think of and that I can remember. Um, this election is the first election that I did not cast a vote for a Republican for president. Because I knew better. And, and that was important enough to me to, for the first time in my, my life, not vote for a Republican for president. Because I found a candidate who represented everything that I believed in. I mean, down to the T. Um, abortion, Second Amendment, trade, schools, everything, everything, and and I I sat on it for a few days, 
because I mean where I live we've been doing melon melon voting or drop boxes for for years just because of being rur- being rural so I did I sat on it for a few days trying to you know trying to decide and ultimately that's what I came up with I I know better and when you know better what choice do you really have you're either doing what you know is right or you're doing something contrary to that thinking that oh well the lesser the lesser of the two evils is who I would rather have the person that I voted for had absolutely no chance of winning the election because he's not on enough ballots in enough states to get 270 electoral votes but that doesn't matter health <laughs> most of the time when I vote the people that I vote for don't get in but that's not the point the point is doing the right thing and if you're going to do that for even the you know the lowest represent representative on the ballot you should do it for the highest representative on the ballot once you know better and you know the consequences of your choice what choice do you really have we're all guilty of party over principle to some some point in some degree um and that's you know you have to draw that line somewhere are you going to continue to put party over principle are you going to continue to vote for the people that yeah would make a better uh, representative than this person but is still not the right choice do the right thing if we all just do the right thing regardless think of how much better our society is going to be how much better our our country and how more how that's the right way to say this without sounding like an idiot how much more free our, our posterity will be much more freer <laughs> but <clears throat> that's the thing we're going to be held accountable for those things in the next life it's talked about in the in the scriptures it's talked about in the early days of the church and then we don't talk about those things anymore but it's something that we need to talk about do what's right I think that here's the problem with that, with that um, is it's easy to convince yourself that what you're doing is right that's yeah. every, every side in a conflict in a war they believe that they, they have to have some kind of moral justification they, can, they have to have some way of convincing themselves of what's right um, when you get into things like politics and stuff like that the same thing applies it's easy to to say, oh, because of this, it's right, or because of that, it's right. When you get into um, governing and laws, it's easy to make those those judgments and and convince yourself of your of your the reason why your your line of thinking is correct. The people who are a lot of the the kids who are caught up in like Antifa, they're caught up in it because they're trying to do the right thing, you know. And there is. Like there was, there was a, um, there's this video about Antifa. It's uh, racing the black flag. Um, it's been banned off of YouTube. It's on BitChute. But um, it's uh, basically they did a documentary of the, uh, the Antifa organization. And one of the guys that was in the interview, and he was a, he was, he was another black. What do they call him? Black, um, black block, where they dress up in black and they go in front of the barricades and stuff. And it's, it's, it's an organization, and it's, it's really. Um, Interesting, but he was talking about how he he was believing the the that they were actually fighting against fascism, and he was eventually they got into some in front of some judge's house or something like that, and they were having bullhorns in front of the judge's house, and he's like, he's like, what are we doing? Like he, he asked himself, you know, like this isn't this isn't we're we're, we're one of the baddies, you know, and you're right when you say do the right thing. 
That's absolutely right. But the only way to know what the right thing is is by listening to to the Holy Ghost, listening to using the power of discernment. Exactly. Exactly. And so do the right thing, but don't kid yourself into thinking that you're smart enough to know what it is by yourself. <laughs> well, that's just yeah. That's just the thing. We have we have everything that we've been taught and we've been told um, through the scriptures, through through modern revelation and everything like that. And that's that's how I I, I know better. That's how I know better. It's been when I when I come across the Constitution Party's party platform, for example, the first thing that they talk about for the Constitution Party is this is God's land, and we have to return to that mentality. We have to return to accepting that, that this is God's land and Christ is its prince. The second thing it goes into and talks about is um, abortion, right to life. And, you know, just like we talked about uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, um, it comes down to your you are depriving another individual to the right of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Another individual, because of convenience. I mean, there, like we've said, there is there is a time and a place, and if you have to make that choice, I can't imagine a harder decision. But, I mean, it's just like they said, why should, in the cases of rape or incest, why should an innocent child have to pay for the sins of their father? And I did not, I didn't ever think about that until just recently when I, when I read that. And I'm like, you know what? That's absolutely correct. That's absolutely right. Now, if you have an abortion in those cases, I'm not going to judge you, because that's not my place. But for me, that's that's exactly what it is. Why should an innocent an innocent child have to pay for the sins of their father? Just like we aren't held accountable for Adam's transgressions. But the fact of the matter is. We, we're not held accountable for what we're not accountable for, but our sins sometimes do get cause the next generations to suffer. On the third and fourth generations, when Christ was crucified, the blood is poured out upon the third and fourth generations. When we rebel against God, that's what happens. And it's not, I don't think that that's referring to them being judged for your sins. I think that's referring to their life being made difficult because of your sins. I think that that's referring to the the peace that God allows the the righteous being taken from our their opportunity because of what what we didn't do. Ignorance won't be used as an excuse. It won't be acceptable. No. I mean, we are continually growing. We are continually learning. And that's okay. You know? Um, we're not expected to know everything. Ever. We're expected to learn things as we go. But we're expected to continually learn. To continually be able to discern right from wrong. And, and it's in every aspect of our life. We're continually supposed to continue to learn and and be able to judge between right and wrong at every level and we're not gonna ever know all the rights or wrongs what's always the right thing to do we're not I don't think we're meant to but we're we're meant to continually learn and progress and be able to discern those things and you know like I said from doing this I've learned a lot I have learned a lot from doing this I've relearned the power of prayer, um, the power of discernment, um, you know, and I, I'm not a perfect person, 
I'll admit that. I'll be the first one to admit that. I, do I always do the right thing? Well, no, none of us do. I'm an imperfect person. Um, I have my vices. I have my flaws, just like anybody else. But I'm not going to pretend that I don't have those. Accept those and as something that I need to work on. Um, it's always a continually th continuous thing. It's doing what's right. One of the things that I love in Why are you so damn whiny? I want to say it's in uh, 93, but I don't remember for sure exactly where. Want to look? 93 has so many good things in it. But, um, it basically talks about how we will be judged based off of the light which we have received. Yes. And what that means is, yeah. that, like Mitch said, ignorance will not be an excuse. I didn't want to know, so I didn't. Yeah. <laughs> Good luck with every, that one. Every man has been given the light of Christ, regardless of what church or where. If, if you live in this in this world, you've been given the light of Christ. Most most uh, people call it a conscience. But you have something inside of you that's telling you good from bad. There's something there. You can learn to ignore it. You can learn to tune it out. You can learn to just not believe it or to suppress it. We can train ourselves to do that. But you have it. There's something there. And you choose whether you follow it or not. You choose whether you do what's right or not. And one of the things that... And, and I love in in section 93 where it talks about how um, there there is a, the way that Christ learned. And it gives the, the example of how Christ grew. This is in 16. It says, And I, John, bear record that he, referring to Christ, okay, so I'll start in 15. And I, John, bear record, and lo, the heavens were opened, and the Holy Ghost descended upon him in the form of a dove, and sat upon him, and there came a voice out of heaven, saying, This is my beloved Son. And I, John, bear record that he received a fullness of the glory of the Father, and he received all power, both in heaven and on earth. And the glory of the Father was with him, for he dwelt in him. And it shall come to pass that if you are faithful, you shall receive the fullness of the record of John. I give unto you these sayings, that you may understand that and know how to worship, and know what you worship, that you may come unto the Father in my name, and in due time receive of his fullness. And it continues on in 21, it says, And now verily I say unto you, I was in the beginning with the Father, and, the, and am the firstborn. And all those who are begotten through me are partakers of the glory of the same, and are the church of the firstborn. That's not everybody. That's those who follow him. Ye, are, um, ye were also in the beginning with the Father, that which is the Spirit that which is the spirit even the spirit of truth and thus is knowledge of things that as they are and as they were and as they are to come this is not the part that I was wanting to read apologize got to get into here it says it says that um, he at the beginning he it speaks about Christ in the beginning. He, he descended to blow all men, and, and he didn't have a fullness of grace. It didn't say that he wasn't perfect, but it said that he didn't have everything. And he grew from grace to grace. Um, he grew little by little. When Christ came, I fully believe that when Christ came on earth, he went through the same bell that we did. He forgot everything. He forgot everything. And he um, didn't, didn't have the, the whole picture of before him. He had to learn how to follow the Spirit. He had to learn how to grow. He had to learn. He didn't make mistakes because of his his, his perfection, his divinity. He, he made no mistakes. He was always perfect. But he wasn't always complete. And little by little he grew until he, he gained a fullness. And that's how it says is he gained a fullness. And I don't remember exactly where that... Um, it's in 93, but I obviously... 
There it is, verse 12. And I, John, saw that he received not of the fullness at first, but received grace for grace. And he received not of the fullness at first, but continued from grace to grace until he received a fullness. And thus he was called the Son of God, because he received not of the fullness at first. And then it goes on to 15, where I read earlier, I'm talking about how he, um, the Holy Ghost descended upon him, and he had a fullness. And he, when he started his ministry, he probably did know exactly the whole picture. But growing in his life, he had to grow the same way we do. That's one of the reasons why looking at Christ is always a perfect example of what we can do in our lives. If you study his life, if you study him, if you study his choices, we don't have a ton, but what we have is, is enough to, to give us inspiration for how we can follow him and how we can become better ourselves. We grow the same way. We grow line upon line, precept upon precept. We grow a little here and a little there. And that's why we're able to be judged based off of the light which we have, not just what everybody knows. And that's why it's so dangerous for us to judge each other in the sense of like, oh, you're evil because you make this choice you and do this. You're a bad don't. person because you drink coffee. You're a terrible person because you drink coffee. Straight to hell. <laughs> but that's the thing is like, if we if we continue to to focus on those little things that that ultimately don't make us better, then we're setting ourselves up for division. We're setting ourselves up for not the unity that that comes when we accept Christ. There's a unity that comes from faith in Christ, and that's the thing that that it's meant to be. It's meant to, to unite us. We're, we're, that's that's what, why our country was so united. It's because they stood for freedom and they loved Christ and they loved God. And if we don't do that willingly, yeah. as a society, God will do it for us. What do you mean by that? <laughs> he will turn us back to him he'll destroy not only the wicked but he'll destroy some of the others as well I mean he has collapsed societies in the past he'll do it again the further away we drift from righteousness the closer we come to wickedness the Eber J. Grant said something to the effect of like there's nothing new under the sun the, the, virtue, the vices and the sins and the temptations that come are not new. We've already beaten them. They're just coming up again. We've forgotten how to beat them. The way that we beat them is by returning back to the way we beat them before. Um, I'm, I'm referring specifically to a lot of the, the tyranny that's happening, a lot of the um, things like your your um, critical race theory and your, your gender theory and the stuff that, that promotes wickedness. These things that... Um, that that are evil, they're not new. They've been around before, and we had to beat them before. If you don't understand the Old Testament and why it's part of our, our canon, why it's part of our um, standard works, the Old Testament is where it was before Christ came and, and brought a higher law. But you look at the, the laws of Moses, you look at the, um, the Ten Commandments and the, the way that the Israelites went and they destroyed nations. They, they literally they scourged the earth and Saul was commanded to to um, kill every living thing animals included of these of these people who are rebellious against God the reason that they had to go through that is because they didn't have the higher law they didn't have Christ and they didn't have a way to to propagate that that faith to their children and because because of the wickedness they needed to create a home if they didn't have a home they couldn't preserve the faith in God. If you don't understand that, then it's it's hard to understand why God can be can can ask his his followers, his covenant people, to destroy other nations. That's like, oh, that seems so wrong and that seems so bad, but you just don't have a full picture of it. You don't realize it. You have to understand Deuteronomy to understand why turn the other cheek is so important. You have to understand these things because 
if we don't, we're going to repeat them. We're going to cause problems that are solved in very, very difficult ways. 40 years of, of, of being lost in the wilderness. Sorry. No. No. There's no need to be sorry. I understand. I know who you are. That's just, yeah, if we don't, if we don't as a society come closer to God and closer to Christ, he'll do it for us. Yeah. And that's not a pleasant process. No. No. I mean, even, even if you are to survive, it won't have been easy and it won't have been pleasant. Shut up. You whiny thing. I'm gonna go look and make sure that. Um, we're recording? No, I was gonna go tell a joke, but it's not recording. How we usually do before we wrap up. It's like, oh, it wasn't even on. Oh. But I wanted, to, I wanted to be on this side so that I could tell you that the joke was. And then if it, we really aren't recording, it would be that much funnier. <laughs> <laughs> Let's sit Is there around. Else you want to talk about? We, we, uh. We didn't have a. A preparedness tip. Water. You always need water. The thing that I was going to say, I actually was thinking about water, is like, there's, so, um, I've heard and, and I haven't found out yet, I haven't, um, followed up on this, but there are places where you can get, like, um, used, where they have, uh, if, if, if you can't afford getting barrels or drums for water, you can get, um, used, drums for like medical supplies or for uh, cleaning like like hydrogen peroxide or you know things that had, had have a sterile um, they're things that they they store that kind of stuff in and sometimes you can get them for cheaper from from companies like, um, like medicinal either medicinal or even like um, food grade food, food grade that's what I was trying to get at. yeah and so you can get them for what 30-pound drums for half of what you would cost, what they would cost. They are expensive, but, I mean, you buy it once. Yeah. Um, another thing you can look at is called the, and right now I am specifically recommending a product, <laughs> advertising for a company, um, it's called the uh, Berkey, B-E-R-K-E-Y. No, that's a burka. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, said. Lord. Uh, um, but no, water. If you're wearing one, you don't have to wear a mask. <laughs> water is important. Um, and that would be. What's this burky thing? I don't know what it is. Tell me. It's a filter. Oh, okay. Put water in it, and it filters. Uh, you can look it up online. Just Google Berkey. Big Berkey. B-E-R-K-E-Y. Water is important. You have to have it to survive. B-E-R... If you confuse people, Fred. <laughs> so, look Did into... <laughs> um, yeah. Water. Water, water, water can't live without it or there's also ways that you can build <coughs> a purification system um, one way that you can build one is you can build a pour through type container and do um, sand sand charcoal sand charcoal and that'll filter the water out you'll still have to boil it when you're done but it may be a cheaper option Russell you're just fine. But I guess that's really all I have. One of the things also in, um, in preparation, one of the things I think is also important to do is to have a, Shh. is to expand your knowledge of, of how mechanics works, how um, engineering works, how, these, how, how plumbing works, these, these general things. Expand your knowledge. 
I'm sorry, I might go in too far. No, you talking about engineers. Engineers, engineer engineers my are, are the stupidest I, I, I smart so people in existence. My feelings were hurt by this engineer. Listen, he was really mean. listen here, Did Mister. You know how much I had to listen work? here, Mister. He not not smart. Non-manufacturing. <laughs> when you have to build shit that other retards dream up, it doesn't always work. And I, and I always hate all engineers because of it. All of them. Every single one of them. They all brought, haunt my dreams. And they don't, I don't, they don't think about me one hey. bit. They don't think about me before I go to sleep. But before I go to sleep, I think about them. Do you remember when we had to fix your car? Who fixed it? We did together. We? And then I had to take it to the dealership. <laughs> that is, that's not my fault. <laughs> That is not my fault. <laughs> no, if we're not recording this, this is this is premium content. Oh, episode, what are we? Ten. Ten. It's raining. You done? Is it raining? I was wondering, because yeah. it's colder than it was like an hour ago. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for visiting with us. Oh, oh. Mic drop. Watching. Share this video. Share it with your friends.